in 2011, the song Friday, by Rebecca Black, started trending online. Critics called it the worst song, ever, making fun of its monotonous lyrics, and awkward music video. Even though Friday made Black a millionaire through iTunes and YouTube ad revenue, everyone thought Black would go down in history as a laughing stock. However, the artist Jacob T.O.T. suggested otherwise, in an essay entitled The Value of Being Trilled. No one makes fun of your video, unless there is something important to make fun of. I'm not arguing that you have succeeded in creating social change or critical dialogue, but I am arguing that if you get people to make fun of you, you have the beginnings of what it takes to be a good entertainer. In the world of art and entertainment, being respected and being made fun of, are interrelated. A decade has passed, and these pronouncements have become prophetic. Black is respected as a cultural icon in her own right. Her presence graces the queer stylings of Dorian Elector's My Agenda project. We can only conclude, that the epic of Andy Warhol has come full circle. The name of its game is no longer glamour, but cringe. In January 2022, The Atlantic published How Did We Get So Cringe? In the article, Caitlin Tiffany writes that in a world where every facet of life becomes destined to be gawked at online, we have become painfully self-conscious about everything. Caitlin concludes that cringe has accelerated beyond an empathic response of shared embarrassment, into the realm of taboo. In April, Vice took the opposite position, with the article will be cringe set you free. This article was the culmination of an onslaught of cringe acceptance memes echoing the premise of a psychology book by Melissa Dahl, proclaiming cringe as everyone's true self. So, is cringe a repressive force, or a tendency towards radical acceptance? To answer this, we can do worse, and have a look at some concepts from the work of Pierre Bourdieu. Bourdieu was a social scientist who analyzed taste, as a product of objective conditions of class and capital. In distinction, a social critique of the judgment of taste, he did an ethnographic study of France in the 1960s. Taste, to Bourdieu, is a form of something he calls symbolic capital. Symbolic capital affirms that a person, or institution, belongs at the top of a social hierarchy. However, the affirmation hides the economic principles behind the person's symbolic stature and the working class must recognize as symbolic capital as natural qualities that people or institutions innately possess. Bourdieu wrote, that taste is symbolic capital, that the ruling class uses to differentiate themselves from those below, in service of class hegemony. Art patrons have symbolic capital, because they are deemed as tastemakers, as people must take their buying power for authority. Symbolic capital also fulfills the function of naturalizing economic and cultural capital for institutions, taken in its immediacy, art carries values and sentiments that endear the institution to a general public. However, what they can steal is their economism, art doesn't gain traction just for their immediate, symbolic aura. They serve as tax dodges for real estate, or, are exhibited because they fulfill a specific role in the marketplace of ideas. Because symbolic capital appeals to authenticity, anti-institutionalism itself has symbolic capital. Things that are excluded from the realm of the upper class always return in aesthetic form, for their symbolic capital. So, if we were to think of cringe as a kind of symbolic capital, what kind of cultural hegemony produces it? This is hard to pin down, as cringe is a global social media phenomenon, emerging under conditions where class distinctions seem nebulous. Taste appears more relative than ever. What is cringe in one country may come off normal in another, what is cringe one month may be fashionable the next. Because standards are infinitely malleable in internet culture, it is impossible to tell if people are laughing with, or at, others. It appears that Dorian Electra reclaims 4 chance edginess for queer culture. But we should not forget that this could have only happened with the normalization of what used to be cringe. People used to think of the act of posting controversial content as unsavory behavior. But this is now normalized in the hot take factory that is Reddit, and Twitter. 4chan used to be a space for pariahs, but now it has an air of exoticism, mentioned alongside pioneers of post-internet art. The internet has also changed the nature of celebrity. 
Before Doria and Electra, back in 1999, the godfather of the cringe aesthetic was arguably rich in Lotax Kayanka. Lotax became affluent and culturally recognized from the cringe comedy website somethingawful.com, which crowdsourced content such as Photoshop edits, writing, and animation from its community's message board. This was a predecessor to meme templates and shit posting. Something Awful is now recognized as a genesis for internet culture as we know it today. Before 4chan, there was Something Awful. 4chan's community branched off from people Lotax banned, for posting enemy. Something Awful's ethos, of embracing cringe, can be summarized, by its tagline, the internet makes you stupid. In true form, Lotax admits feelings about his popularity, expressing dislike for memes in 4chan culture. Lotax even rejected a $13 million buyout, offered by a media company, opting to keep control of his website. At the twilight of his influence, Lotax subsisted off the goodwill of his community on Patreon. Eventually, this goodwill, along with his influence and savings, would wane. Lotax committed suicide on December 2021. Using Lotax's story as a point of reflection, Perhaps the archetypal cringe lord is not someone barred from symbolic capital, but someone whose humanity becomes debased in their means of obtaining it. They are, spiritual casualties, of technocratic capitalism. Symbolic capital follows a trail, of technology developing faster than we can naturalize our relationship to it. In moments where we become cringeworthy, at the feet of the overlords of attention economy, symbolic capital naturalizes our reduction to social media currency, Rebecca Black and Lotax come from the same place, as figures whose souls and images become warped by social media. This warping, this cringe, eventually becomes cool, because it is different. In protest of the modern world, Lotax is a figure who produces difference, but who is ultimately absorbed into what he opposes. He isn't the first and won't be the last. Symbolic capital has subsumed resistance to progress long before social media. Before the internet made us stupid, the industrial revolution made things cringe. In the mid 19th century, the arts and crafts movement attempted socialist reform through production methods. The movement began in London, 1851, as a reaction towards the great exhibition and the works of industry of all nations. Proponents criticized products of alienated labor and industrial design, criticizing their vulgar ornamentation. Driven by nostalgia, for simpler times, they vowed, to preserve a material literacy passed down, through traditional craftsmanship. The arts and crafts movement was focused on reforming production, rather than the production of symbolic capital. However, its counterpart, Art Nouveau, turned this revivalism into a visual language for the new bourgeoisie. As the world became more connected through the opening of trade routes, Art Nouveau stylized arts and crafts as naturalism to the point of hyperbole, introducing it, as a defining aesthetic for the emerging international middle class. In the process where civilization becomes increasingly augmented by technology, there are always people who appear to challenge norms, then people that rise to this challenge and absorb their aesthetic, changing the symbols that justify cultural hegemony. The meme template, reject modernity is particularly revealing, in regards to the state we find ourselves in. Our dream of returning to a natural state is replaced by archaic internet trends. A variation of this meme depicts Peppy the Frog, in a parody, of Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, a painting by German Romantic artist Caspar David Friedrich from 1818. Wanderer was a key work in German Romanticism. Friedrich was schooled, by teachers from the Sturm und Drang movement, which translates in English as storm and stress. Stern und Drang was against the Enlightenment. Opposing a world of objectivity, reason and control, it turned instead to nature, and emotion, as a source of authentic experience. Stern und Drang paintings typically depicted storms and shipwrecks, depicting the irrationality of nature. Friedrich's wander confronts a sea of fog, looking out over the tumultuous world. He wears an old German outfit from the 17th century, identifying with the past, and lost greatness, this becomes Peppy, embracing cringe. In the total loss of human dignity, Peppy valorizes cringe as the most valuable content of his soul, and the liberation of that becomes the most vital human mission. In an irony-poisoned world, 
Even pretending at intense emotions feels like a sham. So Peppy cringes before it. To basement is taken as authentic. <laughs> the last century saw the increasing atomization of society under global neoliberalism, with all visual traditions collapsing into a technocratic melting pot. All counterculture becomes systemically absorbed into clouds of attention economy. We no longer dream of existence outside rationalism, or alienated labor. Instead we hope for, a fluid alienation, where we are at least amorphous within our cages. The modernist spirit of revivalism saw artists confronting horrors of the modern world, rejecting progress and valorizing the desire to return to the past. For the postmodernists, everything collapses into the surface, and the tendency towards revivalism, is reduced to retro trends. At the height of commodity fetishism, where we have lost historical ground, and instead identify with object relations, we have lost even the values associated with retro trends. Our current identities are a pastiche of past images, and we are reduced even further, from retro to regression, where state of fragmentation is taken as the height of human agency. Artists reflect existentially on cringing conditions of nostalgia and irony, finding an affinity in forms from the past. Art experienced as children always seems more authentic. However, as the artist comes of age and realizes that these sentiments were manufactured by corporations, that their childhood affinities were cringe, they can only adopt a position of detached irony. As such, mashup is the visual legacy among those who insist on counterculture on the internet. The mashup artist believes that we are at the end of history, and all styles have been exhausted. Their only recourse is to combine genres of the past, reducing them to cocktails of surface effect. What differentiates their taste from the mainstream is an attitude of nihilistic debasement. In the mainstream, the mashup approach is, less subtly, converted to symbolic capital. Advertising functions on a power that comes from insisting on a symbol that gives meaning to the mashup, however spurious it may be. This turns Dada's chaos into an efficiency and aggregation. McLean Advertising created the Monster Energy logo to be sufficiently devoid of meaning, in order to be filled with significance for early adopters. The logo is an empty symbol that aggregates visual clouds of music, and fashion subcultures, associating Monster with visual genres pre-established in other realms of consumer activity. Instead of returning to tradition, the Monster Energy logo goes back to the future. This is why Monster has symbolic capital in contemporary art. It is a post totem in the age of techno-feudalism, a totem that drives in the loss of tradition, and in its place, hyperstition, driven by memethic emptiness. The monster aesthetic is used by music icons like Elektra and 100 Gex, as hyper-pops modus operandi is to mash up musical styles formerly deemed cringy, and present them as a form of visceral power. Monster energy is at the heart of this melting pot function. The mashup is also a tool of demographic aggregation. Films such as The Lego Movie, and Ready Player One, are scripted to aggregate at intersections of fandom. This culminates with TikTok, whose user experience is best described as mashup on speed. The app runs on video and audio remixes, happening at an accelerated rate, making sure no stone in network aggregation is left unturned. Virality no longer thrives on originality. It thrives on the ability to manifest false difference, to diversify content, within hegemonies of monetized intellectual property. These are the conditions that propels cringe in the current paradigm. The cringe icon, formerly known as, Lao Cao, in earlier stages of cybernetic acceleration, is someone who embodies capital, by coinciding with the real, of network aggregation. Symbolic capital no longer comes from the difference between the tastes of the ruling and working class. The cringe icon is a pure difference collapsed into human form, ironic distance inverted as oblivious over proximity. The cringe influencer is someone none of us want to embody, but have to accede to, as a figurehead for the order of atomized culture. Gone are simpler times, when internet users share the Numinima video, as a gesture of post-irony. Today we are seeing the mass phenomena where millions of people participate, and identify with cringe, out of structural necessity. In January 2022, a TikTok user called Jamie BSH posted a video of himself dancing in front of a bathroom mirror, to say it right, 
by Nelly Furtado. As of this video essay, Jamie's clip is over 400 million views and 51 million likes, spawning a TikTok trend of its own. The trans meme template perfectly illustrates the sentiment that cringe will set you free. People stitch videos of themselves bobbing in front of their bathroom mirrors, before abruptly cutting to the video of Jamie. Jamie is their two selves, a symbolic difference, ad infinitum, that unites everyone's subjugation to cringe. One can only conclude that cringe is symbolic capital in its purest form, disguising algorithmic totality as a naive, immediate pleasure. In the act of swallowing its own tail in a hope of a perfect regression, the Ouroboros of humanity turns itself inside out, 